Reality TV practically runs on controversy. We love to watch the big blow-ups, the outsized personalities, and all the drama in front of and behind the camera. There's an entire cottage industry of reality TV, behind-the-scenes podcasts, and blogs that track the behind-the-scenes drama. We love to watch these controversies for shock value, but they also show us how serious real-world issues can become real-world issues. Mike using the N-word definitely is a soft spot for me. Reality TV producers cast with an eye towards bringing big, clashing, explosive personalities together to stir up drama and gain viewers. Even if that means leaning into troubling stereotypes, they also often shape the narrative of a series to be more sensational than reality, which turns reality TV into something that's anything but. This can lead to extended harassment and ongoing problems for cast members. It's a way of telling stories that I found kind of interesting for a while, and then you know, you realize you have no agency on that show. But as scripted as reality TV can be, it still illuminates something about human nature and intersects with bigger topics we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Here's our take on some of reality TV's biggest controversies and what they can teach us about both reality TV as a whole and the world beyond the cameras. The reality part of reality TV often comes from how real the people are. True story. Seven strangers <laughs> picked to live in a loft and have their lives taped. Shows like Love Island and Big Brother highlight how their contestants are constantly under surveillance, with cameras even in the bathrooms. We ask each and every one of our house guests to wear one of these from the moment they wake up in the morning. To the moment they go to bed at night. These days, you can even pay to access a live feed of the Big Brother house to see that reality unedited. But even if the feed isn't being curated, the contestants are. So how do producers decide who represents reality? For years, reality shows have taken heat for their homogenous, thin, white, heterosexual casts. The Bachelor franchise has been repeatedly criticized for how its non-white contestants are often eliminated in early episodes. So unfortunately, I am going home. Um, uh, she found out I was Asian right away. The show began in 2002 and didn't have a non-white lead until 2017 with Bachelorette Rachel Lindsay. And even during that season, the show often talked around race. When people of color do get to become central characters on these mostly white shows, they're often made to perform their identities on camera in dehumanizing ways. For example, one Big Brother producer was reprimanded for pressuring a black female contestant to speak more stereotypically, suggesting phrases and behaviors to her during interviews. This tendency to lean into harmful stereotypes when characterizing cast members of color is practically built into Survivor. Ramona Gray Amaro, the very first black woman to appear on the show, says she was edited to fit another popular racist stereotype. I became the lazy person, which is the farthest thing from the truth. Anybody that knows me knows that, that that's just not me. These experiences are apparently so commonplace on Survivor, competitors organized a petition to demand better treatment and better representation from the show, something ultimately CBS pledged to prioritize during casting due to the overwhelming response from fans alike. If something comes up that you want to talk about it, talk about it. Who knows, we might learn something. Reality TV also has a big problem stereotyping queer people. Big Brother season two winner Brian Dowling was represented as overly effeminate and camp while Richard Hatch, the first winner of Survivor who became infamous for his scheming operatics, was represented as an outright predator, a dangerous stereotype about gay men. Is there any horny gay men out there that want a horny guy in return? I know one. Kim Stoles, the first lesbian competitor on America's Next Top Model, was likewise criticized for being presented as too masculine and was depicted as quote-unquote seducing a straight woman. Trans reality TV contestants can sometimes be put in uncomfortable or unsafe situations by producers looking to exploit their identity for publicity and controversy. Big Brother producers forced Audrey Middleton to come out as a trans woman on the first day of her season in order to make the production team look inclusive. Relatedly, reality dating shows have a long history of sensationalizing and othering queer people by treating them like gimmicks, especially in the early 2000s. There's something about Miriam cast a trans woman as the lead in a dating show, but instead of centering her humanity and complexity, it exploited her identity for shock value. Not only did a Shot at Love with Tila Tequila used Tila's bisexuality as a gimmick, it forced its lead to date men who denied the existence of bisexuality and constantly demeaned queer women in order to drum up controversy. I'm a bisexual. 
Caitlin Cusinelli was cast on The Real World alongside vocally transphobic housemates who she was forced to live with as part of the show. I have nothing to hide, but the one who does have something to hide is Caitlin. Casting individuals from minority groups alongside fellow castmates who would undoubtedly stir the pot became commonplace, likely for maximum drama. When I first saw John, I thought he was a big time queer. I really don't know. He seems kind of rough and tough over here, but he does all the cooking, so I don't know. I won't be sleeping next to him tonight. Will Collins was the very first person kicked out of the house in the very first season of Big Brother, both because he talked about race with the other housemates and because people were uncomfortable with his ties to the Nation of Islam. I don't want to be, again, be known as the, the black... Um, superhero for black rights on this show. Even Omarosa seemed to suspect she was the villain in her season of The Apprentice, at least in part because of her race. I don't think that they've ever been around a strong African-American woman, to be quite frank. Fortunately, thanks to the shifting tastes and social justice values of Gen Z, we're starting to see some improvements in these once tokenizing, stereotypical casting decisions. Survivor and Big Brother have dramatically increased the amount of non-white contestants on the show, to the point where a recent Big Brother season featured an alliance of black contestants. It is so beautiful, amazing, and historical to come into this house and see people who share my culture, who share my upbringing, who I can bond with. Even The Bachelor responded to controversy around a racially insensitive comment from longtime host Chris Harrison by removing him from the franchise before the season finale and replacing him with a host of color. And the recent queer season of Are You The One exploded romantic possibilities on a show that is mostly a silly series of hot people hookups. There has never been a show that I have seen that focused on the dating experiences of LGBTQ plus people. For years, women have faced a double standard on reality TV. Though plenty of reality shows thrive on hookups, men are typically lauded for sleeping with a lot of women, while women who decide to sleep with a guy are slut-shamed. Jersey Shore relentlessly played up the antics of guys like Mike the Situation Sorrentino and Pauly D, while Angelina Pavarnik was mocked for sleeping with a guy as part of a broader harassment campaign that led to her leaving the show. All right, Kim Kardashian. You're more Good. like the Rob Kardashian of Staten Island, you ugly b the Bachelor franchise distills many popular ideas of romance into a packaged fantasy. It celebrates romantic gestures, roses, and professions of love, while also doubling down on society's double standard for women who have and enjoy sex. Men who star on the show frequently admit to sleeping with all three remaining contestants during their fantasy suites episodes without facing any consequences, but their Bachelorette counterparts are not afforded the same luxury. Nick Vile publicly criticized Andy Dorfman for sleeping with him and not marrying him. And again, when Caitlin Bristow slept with Nick during her season, the series Men Tell All special was devoted almost exclusively to slut-shaming the woman who was supposed to be the star. You've made some controversial decisions. Spreading hate the way people have been is not okay. Seasons later, the problem persisted, and Caitlin had to come to Bachelorette Hannah Brown's defense when one of her contestants tried to shame her for her fantasy suites behavior. So, like, I have had sex. And I, Jesus still loves me. These double standards don't just impact fan perceptions of the women cast members, they also seep into the culture of these productions and make it easier for men to get away with harassing women at what is effectively their workplace. In Survivor's Island of the Idol season, contestant Dan Spilo made several women on the island uncomfortable from the first episode of the season, touching them without their consent and refusing to stop. I'm like, taking little, I'm like, don't touch my face. It's like, you can't do anything about it. There are always consequences for standing up. This happens in real life, in work settings. After five cast members experienced this harassment, contestant Kelly Kim tried to address his behavior on the show. Like, it takes five people to be like, man, like, the way that I'm feeling about this is like actually real, like it's not in my head, like I'm not overreacting to it. But the incident wasn't handled by the production like a serious case of workplace harassment. It was handled like fodder for reality television. Kelly had to navigate the politicking and alliances that are typical of Survivor, and ultimately she was voted off the show before Dan. Eventually, Dan was removed from the show when his behavior affected a member of the crew, but the fact that the situation was allowed to continue for so long demonstrates how easy it is for a production to ignore sex sexual harassment, and how that culture can harm women in the game of the show and beyond it. I spoke up and I was not being supported or believed. And we've already taken important steps to lay out new policies, procedures, rules, 
and methods for reporting that will create a better and safer environment for future players. Another way reality TV producers have prioritized drama over safety, especially for women, is by encouraging drinking on set from cast members. In the early years of reality TV, producers on shows like Big Brother actively looked for participants who drank a lot and encouraged situations where they would be likely to abuse alcohol. In some cases, that led to, at best, gray areas around consent and sex, which is especially troubling on dating shows where those kinds of interactions are the goal. But reality TV's disregard for the health and safety of its cast members seems to have reached a tipping point after two former cast members of Love Island tragically took their own lives. Productions have gotten more serious about mental health and safety. In 2019, Love Island and other shows committed to new policies to protect the mental health of cast members before, during, and after participating in a reality show. Reality TV producers try to stoke drama by casting clashing personalities and creating policies on set that encourage conflict, but sometimes the drama is even more directly engineered. Shows have gotten into hot water for representing so-called real events that are completely faked. Producers have used influence, airtime, even money to encourage cast members to behave in certain ways. You would get bonuses if the ratings went up. Oh, yeah. Spencer Pratt and Heidi Montag, cast as villains on The Hills, recounted producers' efforts to get them to call off their own marriage in an effort to create drama. Didn't they want you to not go through with oh, your own wedding? Oh, they kept on turning yeah. off the lights and, you know, like saying, oh, you know, let's just call it. But active producer manipulation of contestants isn't the only way that shows have gotten in trouble for altering what we think of as reality. In editing, the show can use hundreds of hours of footage to make almost anything happen in order to serve the narrative arc or story the show wants to tell, something even the producers themselves admit to doing. I'm like, these are the facts, and they're like, we don't care about the facts, Carol. Spencer Pratt has alleged that an entire phone conversation on the Hills was stitched together from separate calls with producers, and one particularly infamous clip from Love is Blind shows the amount of food dramatically changing in between moments of a conversation. No, look it! This man has food on and it's gone! When people on reality TV are given dishonest villain edits and made to look awful, the consequences can spill over into the rest of their lives. The Hills ended in 2010, but Spencer Pratt says he still receives angry tweets and online harassment about the things he said on the show. Because I would get death threats, I would get like so many people wanting to hurt me. People love to describe reality TV as a quote unquote train wreck. That's not just an expression. In the same way that people are drawn to tragedies and accidents, we're also drawn to the chaotic, messy, and self-destructive people who make up the casts of our favorite reality shows. While there may not ever be a clear-cut way to produce a reality show that doesn't play into some sort of controversy, we're looking forward to seeing more improvements that make us feel a bit less conflicted about the train wreck we all hate to love to watch. That's the take. Click here to watch a video we think you'll love, or here to check out a whole playlist of awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.